first up is the return of the Guardian's media correspondent, Jim Waterson. Jim, bad news. You've been in court all week. Uh, what have you been? What are you going to go down for? Uh, well, I've, I've I've sadly not been in court for the first time in in a few weeks, but I have been covering the various Prince Harry phone hacking trials, uh, which for those who can't quite follow, we've had we've had two two that are sort of pending and one which is going to full trial next week against the Mirror. So. Uh, I've spent the last few days reading about, I think I worked out about 200,000 words of legal filings to get all up to speed. So in my head, it is 2002. Uh, various EastEnders actors that I've never heard of are on the front pages. And um, and Piers Morgan is editor of The Mirror. Uh, so is Harry going to win? <laughs> That's a, what a question. Um, Has he got, he's got a chance? He obviously has a chance because mm. the, the judge has uh, allowed it to go to trial. Um, it, it's very, very messy. Um, you know, there's there's three parallel cases all about stories that happened a very long time ago uh, and they all have their own merits and, and weaknesses of the, the individual cases. Harry's one against the mirror is, is going to be interesting. There's going to be a lot of reappraisal about who knew what when. Um, there's obviously going to be mentions of Piers Morgan who has had as we all know, multiple run-ins with Harry and Meghan Markle over recent years, um, and it's going to be it's going to be quite the the legal bun fight. Um, the seven weeks of it to come, starting next Wednesday. I mean, really, he wanted to break through this firewall, doesn't he? This idea that the only troublesome behaviour was at the News of the World. Uh, everyone else was was perfectly clean. This starts to chip away at, at the defence from the other newspapers. Sure. Well, the maddest thing is that we've sort of all forgotten this, that the Mirror accepts that phone hacking took place as a lot of its titles and has already paid out an incredible Mm. sum of money, but just doesn't get the attention that uh, that uh, Rupert Murdoch's uh, News UK uh, gets. Um, And and that's quite weird because reporting this out, you, you almost feel that half the time you're shocked by things that were in the public domain 10 years ago. And I think part of it is is almost a reappraisal of it in 2011 there was a bit of a this is shocking but sort of we all half knew they were up to it and at a decade's distance it feels more shocking Mm. i think some of the activities and some of the methods that we use just as a sort of standard way of getting stories um is quite extraordinary but the mirrors um you know legal filings i've been going through and i'm gonna try and avoid boring people too much but (laughs) They've had teams going back through lots of the stories that people, including Prince Harry, claim were from phone hacking and other illegal means. And a lot of it is saying, well, no, this wasn't from phone hacking. This was from your mate who sold you out. Or Mm. this wasn't from phone hacking. This was from uh, your father's press officer who was having a drink with the editor. And in some ways, that's sort of been as disturbing to read as to actually think of the the, the sort of invasion of someone's voicemails. Um, but, you know, we, we've had the male hearing, we've had the uh, hearing against the sun, and now we've got the mirror. Um, it really is going to be the Prince Harry legal tour for the next year almost, if all of these go to trial. Uh, and I guess, Scott, you've been uh, also joining me, a uh, media writer, Scott Bryan. Hello. Um, uh, you've been head down in preparation for your big uh, r- reporting uh, feast coming well, up. I'm sort of thinking that whilst Jim has been reading 200,000 words of legal documents about phone hacking, I've been writing 200,000 words of preparation for Eurovision. I've got in front of me, actually. <laughs> I my... am also going to Eurovision, by the way. Okay. So, oh, so, so in, in the Guardian can do high and low <laughs> culture. So next week I've got two days of the phone hacking trial followed by two, do- two days up in Liverpool. Well, we can have pina coladas <laughs> by the Liverpool Museum, which are, <laughs> trust me, are real. Um, I've got here a 37 page document which can take all of every single entry facts for each one weird lyrics betting odds um because there's too much info yeah this is literally info mageddon <laughs> and it is something that when you're covering a live event you really want to be prepping a lot in um advance so i think i've had a rather weird and surreal weekend where i've been writing about moldova's staging just in, in sheer preparation. And for those of, the, obviously, the, we all know about Moldova staging, but for <laughs> listeners at home, what, what, what's what been happening with Moldova staging? Well, they are, um, uh, the staging is seen to be, uh, will be involving drums, pagan rituals. Um, they have been having deer heads in the music video. There's uh, epic flutes and halfway <laughs> Not through... Not just flutes, 
Epic flutes. Epic flutes. The song is sung in Croatian. Um, and uh, halfway through, a drum beat kicks in, according to my notes. So, like... Sorry, it's... Moldova's entry is, summing, is sung in Croatian. No, that's wrong. Oh, <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> on that there's, bo- a new, there's a new Balkan war that's yeah, going sorry, to break sorry, out. Sorry, because let me, of, let me re-edit that. On that bombshell, we'll come back to talk, talking it's Eurovision gone. a little bit later, oh, no. a little bit later on. <laughs> I've um, really done myself in my own grave here, haven't I? <laughs> no, Scott. Don't worry, Scott. We're going to be talking first about another form uh, of writing. Uh, if you're in LA or New York uh, last week, you may have heard the unmistakable sound of furious scribbling and keyboard bashing as thousands of writers scramble to deliver scripts ahead of the biggest writer's strike for 15 years. Uh, Now, this is an American dispute, but it also has consequences for writers, producers and viewers here in the UK too. Um, Scott, what's been happening with uh, the WGA in uh, the US? So it's the Writers Guild of Great Britain. Um, They've been supporting the WGA strike and basically saying that members um, should not be working for um, any US production um, if it is within the jurisdiction of the strike. I think it's really rather interesting because a lot of people are making comparisons between now and the last big writer mm. strike, which was in 2008-ish. And I feel that that, of course, had huge impacts. You know, late night comedy was off the air for weeks, but also big TV productions uh, were massively affected. Of course, we all feel nostalgic to series like Heroes, which I think mm. were damaged and never really were able to come back in, in its popular form as well um, following it. But I do think that the media landscape has changed considerably within those 15 minutes, which might be actually, I think, a disadvantage to the strike per se, and more of an advantage to the studios. Because before, it was tied to the US um, uh, sort of prime time um, series, with them having 20 episodes a year. It dramatically had an impact on the fall to spring TV schedule. So it meant that the impact could be felt quite quick on, on the actual TVs that you would be able to watch. Now, of course, if Netflix are finding that their US productions have seized up because they're not able to have the writers for it, they might be more kind of inclined to go, okay, well, we'll invest more in Europe or we'll spend money in South Korea. Um, The rise of reality show TV has also had a a big impact too because, of course, that doesn't require Mm. writers, even though, of course, when you watch reality TV, it might feel like it has actually been written. So, so, So I think it'll be interesting to see, of course, how long it is. The longer it is, the more of an impact it will um, result in. I feel like so far it's only been US late night TV shows Mm. have been affected. But of course, if that turns to weeks, if that turns to months, then it will have much more of an impact. So it's certainly one to keep an eye on. I mean, Jim, are there any UK productions that are likely to be affected by uh, this US writer strike? Well, there's a few co-productions, but again, it's that globalisation issue that means that it's easier to skirt around and find your non-unionised staff and your uh, ones that aren't covered by this particular Writers Guild elsewhere in the world. Um, I, I mean, the thing that I always think about is, uh, and, and we've all sat through um, various talks by Kevin Ligo at ITV, who always likes to fall back on the, the, the phrase, you know, that whenever I lose a viewer to Breaking Bad, I lose it for months, that there is an option now. Like, there's not the gap in the schedule. You might just find that people go off. Does Netflix just go in six months time if it's got a shortage of material well we'll just re-promo mm. some show that didn't really fly first time around do we just spread it a bit thinly so rather than launching a couple of shows a week we launch one um and the the, the, the gap isn't as embarrassing immediate or you don't have those big advertisers knocking on your door going what the hell happened to that thing you promised i mean this is this is part of the reason that the strike exists sort of the rise of the streamers and uh, u.s network writers used to writing 23 26 episodes a season uh, now the seasons are six episodes long and it changes the economics for them the whole economic model has completely changed and um now of course if it's on a streamer um it might have a very short life because of course streamers like to cancel things mm. but also the syndication that used to providing a lot of of money for writers and people within the industry and of course how many shows last more than 50 episodes let alone 100 which used to be a feel that the gold bar for when syndication would really kick in so it's it's the problem i think with a lot of things in which the industry is changing at such a breakneck speed but the actual relations that rely on um, a lot of people's income um takes a long time to get to a point to work out a new standard model that everyone's happy with so 
so this is this is a problem there's also of course the potential of ai you know whether that mm. would would change anything and i think the studio so far in the contact agreement have been a bit vague about ai which of course has not given the writers that much confidence yeah we talked about a little bit a little bit about it before but it's uh, the worries the writers will have to rewrite ai uh, sort of scripts I still think it'll be cheaper just to get some humans <laughs> who are desperate for the work to do it, wouldn't it? I mean, I, I think I think there's many bits of uh, journalism in the media I can see uh, being automated out by AI. I mean, I was talking to some people in local papers who are already seeing uh, their sort of, you know, those regurgitated stories. What, why, why pay a new trainee 18 grand when you could get the AI to do it for nothing uh, to just regurgitate a rival's copy? Uh, but when it comes to a big budget drama where you're spending tens of millions, I think you're going to want a, a, a fairly competent human who understands exactly what dialogue would work in that context. Oh, totally. And I think as we discussed on before, and when AI came up on the mm. previous media podcast, the way I've learned about AI is that AI is great at essentially regurgitating existing info or setting up certain pathways of information, for example, traffic reports or the weather. But you can't get an AI to come up with a whole new creative idea. And of course, writing is creative ideas. Unless there's a plan for it to essentially regurgitate existing ones, I just don't see how much of a benefit it well, will have for in, writing. in television, humans are quite good at regurgitating previous ideas as well. No, so. I don't think. On TV? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, it was interesting. Last time there was the strike, two thousand seven. There was a strike for a hundred days. Yeah, uh, and I think I was I was reading some of the reports that a lot of the late night talk show hosts uh, paid for the staff's salaries uh, whilst they were off. And I think Jimmy Kimmel was saying that he got to a point where he got massively involved in trying to encourage an end to a strike because he'd run out of money by yeah. just paying paying all his teams. Oh, that must be so hard for him. <laughs> I mean, down, so to his, down to his final dime. Um, suddenly James Corden's exit last week <laughs> was a, a, a very... Yeah, it's well timed. Choice move, choice move. Um, and do we know whether this dispute does affect kind of UK script writers or are they facing any of the same problems? I feel like, I mean, there have been a few threads I have seen by writers talking about how the economics of not as sustainable in their view as is what, what it was before about how incomes but royalties are not as high as they were and about how there is inequality in terms of where they think the profits from very successful shows end up going towards and i think that uh, you know a challenge is is that if you want to have um, the best writing and also accessible and inclusive for the people who are you know, really there with great creative ideas and then there has to be a, a sustainable income for them and I think the problems that we have within the industry around accessibility and uh, and trying to make sure that the industry reflects the wider com uh, um, uh, the wider population is purely down to you know, the economics not being as good as they could be. Well, it's definitely something we're going to continue to follow and it'd be uh, so odds bets on how long the strike's going to last? Jim? <laughs> There's a mugs game. Um... I, I would imagine it will, I mean, it, th these things tend to have a natural lifetime of a few months because basically people need to start earning money again and go back mm. to work and people need to start producing things. So the sort of crunch point is probably in a month or two. Scott? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've never been involved in a negotiating a, a detailed contract, Scott? No, freelance, yeah. no. Yeah, I do. I do wonder whether Britain, like British writers, are just so used to being paid r rubbish wages that they, they, you know, they, they they might suddenly find they've got more offers well, on the table. Well, someone else who's kind of thinking about, uh, uh, well, someone else who's thinking about the business models uh, is Shane Smith. Uh, Shane Smith uh, from Vice. Uh, he did a, a memorable McTaggart lecture in Edinburgh uh, back in 2016. Do you remember what he said in 2016 about the media sector? Uh, was it, I've just got a big pile of cash from, from some venture capitalists, so I'm going to go and lie on it right now. He said, an impending crisis in the media industry uh, with consolidation among major players and an evisceration of digital businesses who he said were struggling to make their business models work. Did he predict his own demise? I think it's worth knowing for the people listening at home that Scott and I both lived uh, and breathed the BuzzFeed UK boom and bust. And uh, having had a see to that table i think we were slightly less uh decadent than vice but there was certainly a fair bit of uh excessive spending that went on around the around the company um the whole digital media boom of the 2010s now feels like a just incredibly impossible to imagine time um and you know you, you can overthink it but basically a lot of media companies media startups had some 
very good ideas and then convince some very rich people that they were tech companies. Mm -hmm. And you can look for media business questions, but you can also look to an era of zero interest rates when there was just loads of money sloshing around. And if you could convince someone that you were going to be the next... Uh, um, cable tv channel of the future but you just happen to combine you know edgy content with some viral stuff then you could just raise hundreds of millions without almost any effort at all wasn't vice though built on a, a very specific kind of bullshit though <laughs> right from the beginning vice vice was always a very different beast to buzzfeed and vice went far deeper uh, on video than buzzfeed ever did mm. and um always did feel a little bit more like the cool kids to the mass market lot that mm. we were working for. Um, Vice did some incredible stuff, but I often think a lot of the things that people refer to when they think about Vice, um, which is of course still going and still producing stuff and still producing things that I was reading this week by, and I, and I think it's a bit unfair sometimes to talk about it entirely in the past, even though um, the future is not looking too rosy. Mm. But Vice really had that edge of, the word that people there would always talk about was gnarly. You know, we did a gnarly report. We, you know, we, we, we went in with ISIS. We went and did this. Um, and they were good at sort of grabbing the attention of the broadcasters. And I always felt BuzzFeed was a bit more in the lane with the publishers. Um, and you can see the legacy is maybe that the people who honed their skills at Vice went off and got jobs at the BBC and, uh, uh, you know, US cable channels and US news channels. And the people who worked at BuzzFeed went off and got jobs at New York Times and uh, other legacy print outlets. Mm. Um, and really, you know, Vice, the idea that, you know, Vice was ever valued in the billions, um, it's just bizarre. So Vice was at one point valued at five billion uh, pounds. Uh, now it's looking for about one and a half billion. Uh, Scott, do you think there's a suitor out there willing to take it on? I mean, it's really interesting just because I've been reading about how at one point Disney were interested in buying BuzzFeed, mm. that Disney were interested in buying Vice. Of course, it feels so far removed from from where they are now. And it makes you wonder whether in hindsight they would have been sort of making a bad decision by not going down that road at the time. But I think it's it's really interesting because I think it's about more about what these brands represent. And I think for me, it's a fact that it gives so much journalistic freedom for those people who work there. I mean, I'm very lucky to have been at BuzzFeed because it gave me the opportunity to try things out and break things. And I think if you are working within a legacy organization, like um, they tend to be a bit slower when yeah. it comes to coming up with new ideas. I mean, and do you think the legacy organizations just basically adopted the things that BuzzFeed and Vice were doing? They, they synthesized them and fitted them into their own templates mm. a bit because the audiences were clearly showing which ones they were they were drifting towards. Um, and, you know, you look at where, I don't know, small things like headlines on news articles across the whole Internet now resemble the sort of thing that BuzzFeed were being pilloried for in 2013. Listeners might feel that's a bad thing, but it's sort of a statement of fact. Uh, and the visual style of Vice has definitely seeped into the sort of reports you see on the tv news to a certain extent a lot more involved a lot more personal reflections a lot more this is how we've made this thing um and you know a lot of i i kind of feel that a lot of the places realized that they could just hire the staff away cheaper than buying the company that yeah. had incubated those ideas you know those venture capitalists aren't going to see much of a return on their income but um in some ways they did quite a nice job of training up a generation of journalists in a in a new way of thinking however I really don't know if I was a 22 year old now trying to get into the industry where I'd even go for. Mm. Yeah. So it's so disheartening, I think, at the moment, because a lot of these places would invest in new talent and would give them a go and would actually pay them for it and would allow them to maybe provide points of view that legacy media organizations would never really focus on. And I think that's that's what I worry about with the state of digital media is where are the opportunities for people in their early 20s? They've they are fewer to come, uh, harder to come by. I think one sort of thing that I, gives me a bit of like optimism is the fact that you are seeing the rises of places like Substack, mm. where people are able to build up their own distinctive voice, try things out and build up an audience of their own who might be happy to pay a few quid. But that's still not easy, particularly during a cost of living crisis, to encourage people to, to pay and subscribe. 
I think one great thing is that you've got the the internet at your disposal and so many opportunities to try things out and build an audience with whatever niche you want to do. But I feel that the, the issue is, you know, when somebody does build an audience, are they going to get the income that they deserve for it? But sub stacks and things like that, I mean, I, it, you know, it takes you be- the best part of a decade of screwing up to actually work out how to get a voice and how to yeah. write properly and yeah. how to edit properly. And, yeah. to, and to be platformed by some of these uh, locations to get your numbers up as well. Sure. And, and so sub stack, I kind of feel works if you've already got the audience that you can port into it. It's not really a place as a young writer to necessarily make your name. Mm. And... Um, you know, you need years of kind of support to even get close to having that that sort of loyal audience. I don't know. It's pro- it probably is a load of old, old aging people on Substack trying to get a thousand people to pay a tenner a month or whatever, plus um, plus a, a load of kids hopefully reinventing things on TikTok and gaining an audience that way. But... Well, someone who might be looking to start a stub- Substack of his own. Well, someone who might be looking to start a Substack of his own is Richard Sharp uh, from the BBC. Uh, if you were listening to last week's episode, uh, about the same time uh, it emerged that Richard Sharp had resigned as the BBC chair, um, following uh, hot on the heels of an independent inquiry into his appointment. Um, Jim, the report wasn't as damning as maybe it could have been. But it was enough to push him over the edge, wasn't it? It was pretty damning. It was, and I think, Do you think what, so? I think what's got lost in in all of this was that he um, just helped out a mate. Just, just, said, there, just there, there, I think what what got lost in it, it wasn't just that he had had a meeting about potentially introducing someone who could arrange a eight hundred thousand pound loan facility for the serving prime minister kept secret from the public. It was also about the fact that before even applying for the job, he'd had a conversation with Boris Johnson about whether he should go for it, um, and Boris Johnson was the one who then throughout the process made clear that he wanted Richard Sharp to get it. But he's probably not the first that that's happened to. It's not the first that it's happened to, but it's unfortunate that you end up with that actually spelled out in in uh, in an official report. I think the interesting thing is what next for the BBC, because they're going to go from... Richard Sharp had um, many flaws and was obviously Boris's man, but ended up kind of being sucked into the BBC system a bit and becoming... Well, everyone goes native. I think that... That definitely happened. He, oh, you know, you, you saw him on panels like, you know, I turned up ready, having, you know, ready to cut the fat and tell them to slim down. And went, oh, they've got no money. You know, like you could see this on his panels. Like, you know, I was ready to charge in and tell them how to run a proper business. And then I realized, gosh, they, they, they actually need some funding here. Uh, and the the la- Labour has already made noises about wanting to change how the BBC works. Every government does. And they're preparing for government thinking that, well that, that is until it. they get into government when they more than happy to accept I, how it previously worked i have said this to labor people i am looking forward to the moment that uh, that you do it one of it has been quite extraordinary seeing alistair campbell who famously managed to uh, play a role in um deposing a bbc director general and chairman during iraq uh you know talking about how disgusting it is to have the tory influence over the bbc um but um you, you know i i i think uh what this departure will mean is that Rishi Sunak's government gets to put their man in for another four years which could be well into a Labour government and it could be a case of an unknown quantity and be careful what you wish for if you're the BBC. I mean Scott how damaging has this drawn out nature of the process been for the for the BBC? Could it have been sorted before any of the Gary Lineker controversy for example? I mean sometimes I find that these sagas go on for so long it was the case of when Richard Sharp did stand down and I was like oh is that 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 that's today oh okay and then I turned on to the BBC news and it looked like the weirdest CBB's bedtime story ever because they had a (laughs) weird like very it was very loud in the colors and also i i managed to see i think they should have put him in the new bbc news screen room where they talk to uh they talk to correspondents oh yeah 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 but also um um when he gave his um resignation it was a new high point of how many BBC logos can you have on the screen? Because <laughs> there was one on his lectern, one behind him, one on the corner of the green screen. And then because I was watching an iPlayer, one on the other side as well. There was like five. And I was like, this is ridiculous. But anyway, back to the point. Um, I mean, like it was such a dra- dragged out process. And I feel like the longer it went on, the more damaging it was for Richard Sharp, but also the more damaging it was for the BBC. And also just because we were waiting on this report to come out. So I feel that they... You know, to, uh, it, the blame in that regard is essentially just waiting, but the longer you wait, the more damaging it can have. And of course, the BBC, I think, has had a difficult few months. 
I feel that though sometimes there's the new high points of of course the coronation so long as the BBC hits the right tone between people who are monarchists and republicans and trying to reflect this event and then of course with Eurovision around the corner that might change the wider perception but I still think that people are going to be scrutinizing a lot who's going to be ending up to be the mm. new chairperson and I also think that there'll be some people who might be thinking, well, why would I want to stand for this? Because you know, why wouldn't I want to stand for this position? Because, of course, it's a big opportunity in British media. But you are under so much scrutiny. And if you are following Richard Sharp, you, you're going to be scrutinised immediately on every single relationship you've had with the government or every single relationship you've had with you know, other people in different political offices. And that, and that will mean that you're going to be under the spotlight before you even done anything or said anything. There will be no shortage of people who want to be BBC well, who, chairman. Are there There'll any be, runners and riders so far? Um, well, I, it's it's a mugs game because the chairman sort of is often a, a sort of more left field kind of mm. floating above it position. It's probably not going to be someone in the media at the moment. Um, although there is the, uh, you know, the, the, there will be an interim appointed from the existing board in a couple of months time. Um, you know, I... I uh, I think all of this plays into the fact that the BBC got terrified after the 2019 election when Boris Johnson won a fat majority and Dominic Cummings made clear that they were going to squeeze the, the BBC and make it squeal and cut the licence fee. And they freaked out so much over impartiality uh, and whatever that means that they ended up tacking too far in one direction. And no matter what you think, it is a... Uh, it is connected deeply to the British state as an institution. Uh, editorial independence is a different thing, but it is part of it. The, the the money is in some way secured by the government. And I think they've probably realised that they might have screwed up by going a bit too far towards the Tories and now need to rapidly prepare for a potential Labour government, because otherwise that could get very embarrassing if they've really gone too far in one way. And we're back with Jim and Scott for part two. Uh, time for some news in brief. Uh, BAFTA published data on its members on Thursday as part of its ongoing aim to broaden participation with the charity. Um, Scott, what did we learn? Uh, so they issued a lot of data. Um, the split is 58% male, 42% female. Uh, 16% from underrepresented groups, uh, which is below the, the national average of 18%. Uh, 7% um, uh, are people who have a disability, which is quite a lot lower than the 17.8%, which is um, people who have um, um, uh, a disability. And of course, that's something that Jack Fawn has been with his underlying health conditions group really been campaigning on. Um, and 12% uh, are people who identify as being LGBTQIA+. So there's been a big push in a letter that was sent to BAFTA members today saying this is in the right direction, but this mm. is not good enough. I feel that, of course, the main impact we see of how um, the BAFTA members are represented is when we see the nominations and the awards for the TV, games, films and, and, and so forth from BAFTA each year, because, of course, that's what members contribute towards. I feel like an issue that is being prevalent is that whilst there is greater inclusion in the nominations, there's not necessarily coming through in, in the actual um, winners mm. and it's like how do you reflect that because there was a lot of criticism after the BAFTA Film Awards that there was no diversity in the winners at all so I think it's a challenge for them I, I, in, and, and I think it sort of brings it back to the, the wider point that the BAFTA has a real important role to play to ensure that there is greater inclusivity in the media because they would encourage a lot of production companies to think strongly about how they are represented and then that can ensure that better stories and I'm sorry, a better reflection of stories are actually making it onto screen. But a challenge is, is of course, BAFTA merely reflects the media industry mm. generally. So there's only so much that they can do. They can they can yell, they can say, look, this is, needs to be improved. But but actually, unless the media industry uh, more widely takes action, then not much is going to really change. I mean, Jim, this is a story that we and everybody has covered numerous times. Uh, is is change happening or is it just still glacially slow my thought my thought on hearing those figures are they sound an awful lot better than most of the news industry yeah. most of oh, yeah, uh, many absolutely. other bits of the media to be honest um, um you know everyone knows what they need to do and a key thing is recruitment and a key problem to be honest is something we alluded to earlier which is if you haven't got roles for new people to join um then you're not going to be able to change this and if you've got hiring freezes at companies and you're laying off staff or if anyone with a brain can see that this is a you know, a particular bit of the industry is failing, 
um, then you're not going to be able to change your diversity stats because um, and actually have a representative workforce because you can't get in the new talent to to make that change. The, the problem is basically in some bits of the media, it's a bit aging industry and you can't get in the fresh blood to to make the change. Uh, Scott, 14th of May, BAFTA TV Awards. Um, any predictions? Um, it's rather interesting, I think, because you've got um, nominations. I mean, this is the thing I love about the BAFTA TV Awards. It celebrates last year's TV in the middle of the following year. So it's, <laughs> a lot of it is trying to work out exactly... What was on. What was on. And I end up scrolling back to myself thinking a bit like, ah, oh, that's interesting. I think... Um, well, I do like that I saw, I saw on Twitter that you, you keep a note of TV shows that you've liked. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the only way I'm actually able to remember what I've actually seen sometimes. But I mean, it's it's. I, I feel like um, BBC, ITV, Channel Four are still dominating the awards. You are getting much more start edgeways by the streamers after a few years of of quiet persistence. So we'll see whether that will happen on the night. I mean, there's also some big snubs. Um, uh, for example, um, some shows bizarrely don't have actors being represented in them, but the shows are. So you're kind of going to be sort of wondering how that will will play out but it's a busy week because you've got BAFTAs next week the day after Eurovision and the week after the coronation well in other awards news it was uh, the Arias this is the Radio Academy's awards uh, was on Tuesday uh, it says here in the script who wants to congratulate me first I was I was thinking yeah congratulations because you got it for was it gold for mission transmission and the innovation Awards. oh funny you should mention that yeah so uh, Fun Kids the children's radio station that I look after um, got a gold uh, for a great show where kids are all around the country sent messages which we sent into interstellar space wicked and that got a gold for creative innovation also came second the silver yeah in the moment of the year Radio Times public vote, which was good. We just lost out to uh, Liz Truss being destroyed by BBC local radio presenters. I would have felt bad if I'd beaten beaten that. What difference does it make to you when you're running uh, running a company like that? I tell you what, we're a small team, and the team were very chirpy uh, to go on stage and collect that award. Adam, who did the project, did a great speech um, talking about it, and um, yeah, no, it's 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 nice. I mean, oddly, it costs you loads of money to enter them and to send people to the to the awards. So uh, that side, not so good for the bank balance but also it's a great reminder to advertisers to the sector that you're there that you're doing things and how do you think it reflected like the audio industry because of course it's the rare opportunity i think we get you know bbc people independent podcasters and commercial all under the same roof yeah, most of the commercial radio uh, involved um uh, yeah no it's interesting i think uh, looking at the winners this year, uh, BBC did very well. I think they had 18, they were kind of 18 wins. Um, commercial radio, I think probably with five or six, so much less. And then sort of podcasters or new entrants uh, filling it out. So Apple Music uh, won, a sh- won an award with their show with Nara Rogers. Uh, and some independent podcasters did, did quite well. I mean, I think sitting there, it, it's much broader than it used to be. And when I used to go to the Sony Awards at the Grosvenor back in you know, the noughties, uh, it was all very samey, whereas there's a lot of exciting audio out there now mm. um, from a whole range of providers. And it's great that that's, uh, you know, uh, covered by, by the sector. Um, though there is a big radio group that are missing from uh, that group and the, the global, the guys in Leicester Square choose not to take part. Oh, really? Mm. I, I didn't know this. Yes. Uh, is um, it because they've got their own awards? Could no, they do their own internalised one, don't they? The, the problem is that this is, it's the, so old this is like an old problem right um, and uh you don't see many u-turns uh from the people that reside in leicester square uh so people are like i can't even remember why it was basically there was a falling out about who didn't didn't win awards back in the sony days right uh, okay. and they've never quite been able to bring them back into the fold Glo- which is a shame global are a fascinating company if it and uh, and i always feel i should write more about them than i do so if anyone listening to this <laughs> wants to get in touch with uh, me at the guardian about any uh, any global stories i'm all ears because i i think what they do is fascinating but also there's a lot going on there that isn't isn't really fully understood by the public. It's a sh- Some of it's a shame, I think, on, on the awards front anyway, mm. uh, in that I was talking to some some global staff and they were just sad that they couldn't enter. You know, they were proud of their work and, and they'd like it to be recognised. And Global would do great in the Arias. You know, they do, LBC does great stuff, Classic FM does good stuff. So um, I think actually they'd do, they'd do pretty well if they, if they took part. Um, and hey, maybe next year. Maybe next year. And before we go, there's just time for the media quiz. This week entitled AI Fails. I've curated three AI-related stories impacting the media. Uh, Just tell me what the story is from these prompts. 
Oh my goodness. Uh, you've got to buzz in with your name if you know the answer. So Scott, you will say. Scott. And Jim, you will say. Jim. Right, off we go. Uh, question number one. What did anti-misinformation outfit NewsGuard reveal this week? So this was about chatbots. This was a story that I read on The Guardian. I can't remember the detail. God, terrible media. This this is, this is, this look, is, so long as you click the link and you support in The Guardian, the link, that's I'm all that matters. I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I've got a newborn kid. I'm not sleeping a lot at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the answer is this is chatbots pretending to be journalists are running over 50 AI-generated content farms. Um Jim, I mean, what does this mean, and why are they why are they doing it? I, it's not at all surprising. Google has been clogged up with rubbish SEO bait content written by people for pennies for years. So moving to AI, the only impressive thing is they can avoid they can afford the fees of of the AI processing. And you're going to see this in lots of aggregation of news in the next year or so, I reckon. And I can't wait to see the accidental moment when an AI journalist gets sued for libel after accidentally <laughs> summarising something wrong. Would the prompt writer be sued? You you wrote this no, prompt. No, publisher would. The publisher would be like absolutely terrified the moment that it happened. The, the, some CEO will have thought they're very clever and then immediately be backtracking when they realise what they've done. Uh, right, question number two. Uh, which human rights group got into trouble this week for their use of AI? Uh, Scott. Scott. Amnesty International. Yes. Do you know what they were doing? Well, they were covering or showing, highlighting protests within um, Colombia. Um, but to what they say was to protect the identity of the protesters, they decided to share on social media faked AI images of the protests, which they then had to take down. Um, a very convincing image. I mean, if you if you glance by, well, it I'm looking feed, at it right it was, now. It was actually, really, it was you know someone yeah. being led away by the police, and it looked. If you hadn't noticed the little text in the bottom corner saying "created by AI," you wouldn't have thought otherwise. So this is a recreation of the riots in Colombia in 2021. Yeah, and of course it raises questions because, of course, people would see that image and might think it's true, and that kind of implies that, um, particularly that it's shared by a company like. Um, Amnesty International that you would think that actually this is a reflection of what actually happened but well, it was, as you said it was labelled AI is that enough? It wasn't labelled if, if you sort of got a magnifying glass you'd have noticed in the bottom corner that it was um, I mean the problem with all of this is like what do people think is truthy and I think weirdly the only thing that people are going to gravitate towards is is sort of short moving video which people still seem to trust mm. but static images I think are going to have a lot more sort of doubt to the point where people might be reluctant to believe them well, I saw a great ad from the Lincoln Project. This is sort of the anti-Trump group in the US. And what they did, they've sort of gone as an anti-Tucker Carlson vibe at the oh, moment. Yeah. Uh, and they took this uh, text message that he sent uh, talking about um, a, a beating um, uh, dur during the election. Uh, and then they used uh, an AI version of his voice to read out the words that he'd written. Now, again, it was flagged up as, you know, this this is AI. Mm. I mean, it's an impactful ad. I mean, are we going to see more of that where it's not sort of cheating, it's not trying to lie to you, uh, but it, it's just creating untruth uh, to make a point? Absolutely. But also there's like going to be a hot three months where everyone can get publicity by doing something mm -hmm. with AI, AI like that. And then it might become quite boring and people just get used to it and stop doing it to the same extent. It, it, you can still get a headline around the world for doing an AI something yes. at the moment. I mean, I remember watching so on ITVX a comedy that was done by deepfake mm. technology. And it was a comedy that was supposed to be using celebrities and throwing them into unrealistic scenarios. I mean, it wasn't funny. <laughs> um, it just made me feel incredibly disturbed because mm. of the way that they were doing it. And they, they of course, good. had a good. million. Yeah, it looked good. Um, they had a million <laughs> disclaimers throughout it saying it was. But then it made me go, well, what will in the future somebody just basically taking that technology and using it for, for a more sinister means? And I was thinking to myself, actually... I had a bit of sympathy for the celebrities who were taking mm. the mick out of because, of course, of, parody is there in our society and satire is there to to um, uh, make fun of people in positions of celebrity worth, value or, or influence. But there's something I find a bit sinister if you're taking their literal face and then putting them into scenarios without their consent and then putting in a voice which... Um, it gives an impression to some people that it's faked but might be convincing to other people. I mean, that's where I start to go, oh, hang on, you know, what what would a celebrity think about this? Are they thrown into situations that haven't have happened? Uh, right, question three. How did German magazine Die Aktuelle 
get into trouble recently? Uh, Jim, they ran a fake interview with Michael Schumacher mm. or an AI generated oh. interview, um, which turns out to be in quite bad taste. Who yeah. would have thought that? And so they called it Michael Schumacher, the first interview, and he sort of used AI that was trained on previous interviews. And obviously, he hasn't been seen in public um, uh, since sustaining a serious brain injury uh, 10 years ago. Uh, is that just a features meeting gone wrong? I think a lot of this, whether, it, you know, at the moment you can walk into sort of every nervous commissioner's meeting at TV or at uh, or in a magazine and, and go, oh, we've got the AI thing. And they go, oh, that sounds buzzy and cool. Yeah, we'll mm. go for that. And therefore people disengage their brain and go, don't go, is this actually funny? Is this in good taste? Is this actually interesting to anyone? Um, and we're, we're, you know, something creative and interesting will emerge from this. Um, but I also think that it'll end up being a small slither of the media we consume because uh, humans are quite good at knowing what other humans are into and understanding, judging where things are going, whereas AI is quite good at working out what went before and then generating on the back of that. Uh, well, you point each, so you both win the quiz. Uh, <laughs> uh, as the prize, you get to create a new media podcast content farm based on AI uh, for us to soup up our SEO ratings. Uh, well done. Um, and if you'd like more from them straight away, well, it's really easy, but you do have to pay for it as we'll be grilling them for all of their top coronation and Eurovision viewing tips over on our Patreon. So just go to patreon.com slash media pod, uh, support the show. Uh, you'll get their extra content plus uh, a big catalog of loads of other material. Um, plus a big catalog of loads of other material too. Uh, where can people keep up uh, with your work, Jim? Uh, they can't on Twitter anymore because I've just given up on Twitter since Elon took over. Uh, but if they go to The Guardian and um, uh, there'll be all manner of phone hacking stories, which is what's going to keep me occupied all summer and maybe the odd bit of fun and hopefully some dispatches from Eurovision as well. Bit of Eurovision action too. And Scott? I'm going to be all over Eurovision and I'm very excited. So I think I'm doing quite a bit of Five Live stuff next week. I'll be tweeting a lot about stuff on Scotty GB and just following the nonsense really as it unfolds uh, looking forward to reading it and listening to it thank you both